an honor to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, uh, Mr. Paul Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jessica. Good evening. On behalf of the Drexel University Alumni Association, thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Johnson, a graduate from the classes of 92 and 2007, and a member of the Drexel University Board of Governors. Throughout my career, I've utilized my Drexel MBA to help me succeed in roles varying from a strategic account manager to collegiate level coach to teaching at several local universities to my current hybrid career as an entrepreneur and a college instructor. On tonight's panel, we will have Drexel graduates who, like me, have found ways to take their skills and experience they gain with their degrees and creatively apply them to a unique or unexpected career path. Let's meet our panelists. From my right to my left, Drexel um, experience. Uh, I have Jennifer ellsworth Waltz. Jennifer received her master's degree in media studies from Penn State University. In 2011, she graduated with her JD from Drexel's Earl Mack School of Law and is now employed by a law firm in Delaware. Next to Jennifer is Jeff. Jeff is a fellow double grad. He has both a bachelor's degree in civil and architectural engineering in 1998 and an MBA from Drexel in 2010. He is a director of procurement at Loftus Construction Incorporated, where he is responsible for procurement activities, including purchase orders and subcontracts. In addition to the engineering and planning of critical operations associated with bridges and infrastructures. Next to Jeff is Chuck Sacco. Uh, Chuck and I serve on the uh, Board of Governors as well. Uh, Chuck received his MBA from Drexel in 2006. He is an entrepreneur with multiple company launches in the enterprise software and mobile technology industries. He also speaks, writes, and teaches about entrepreneurship while serving on the Alumni Association's Board of Governors. And next to Chuck is Lauren Van Scoy. Lauren graduated from Drexel University's College of Medicine in 2006. In addition to her current role as Chief Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellow at the College of Medicine, she is author of the book, Last Wish. So be prepared a series of questions already submitted that I'd like to ask the panelists. And afterward, we will open the floor for any additional questions uh, that you may have. Uh, so our first question is basically going to be, please give your 30 second elevator speech and include what was the driving force or incentive to pursue your advanced career or your transitional uh, career. So it's open to the panel. <laughs>
unfortunate when I hit my MBA here in 2005 and 6 that uh, I found a mobile technology company that uh, I'm now president of and basically developed mobile phone apps for the hotel industry. Um, we do some very cool stuff in some very interesting places like uh, my last three business trips have been to uh, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Cancun. So not to, not to say that it's nice, but it can be nice. Um, but, uh, you know, they're kind of very fortunate. But, you know, what led me to that point and, and kind of where I am today is that um, there were a couple of kind of big macro and, and micro issues that I was looking at. Macro issues being that I spent the first half of my career um, in the enterprise software industry. After Y2K, that got to be pretty boring because the companies in the industry started to consolidate. They started to get real big. And I realized at the time that uh, I didn't really want to be inside of a big you know, company. Um, so there was kind of that, and uh, also trying to figure out what, you know, even 20 years after my undergrad, uh, what I wanted to be when I grew up. And uh, I was very fortunate to land here at Drexel and get a fantastic MBA and be able to leverage that into uh, just one of the things. So, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, definitely when you look at decisions you make about what you're going to do and whether or not you're going to get a master's degree, um, you certainly need to look at you know, what you need to do from a personal perspective, but also look at the industry forces and what's happening out in the world. I wasn't likely to gain that skill in my role as an 
traveled for me starting at the same um, back in high school. Um, I went to tech school and thought I was going to be Bob Beeler when I grew up and build houses. And for those who don't know, Bob Beeler was sold houses. Right? So I thought I was going to be a carpenter who built houses and was very good at that. Um, because of my success with that, I was afforded a bunch of scholarships. So that gave me the opportunity to go to Drexel. So I didn't know what I wanted to do when I came here, although I knew I liked engineering. So I took the opportunity to go here for engineering. And the co-op program actually drew me here because I did co-op while I was in tech school in high school. So that, that long drawn out thing of wanting to be a carpenter now drew me into being an engineer. Um, and from being an engineer, um, I, I took this opportunity to see that there was a business success as well as a business side, and not just being a technical guy with a pocket protector and having that, you know, that persona. Um, so that road less traveled, it's amazing how it did it. I thought I was going to play with rocks once I graduated. You know, from direction and civil engineering, I was going to play with rocks and concrete for the rest of my life. And now I'm in a position where I'm going to be running a company where we're still playing with rocks and concrete, but I'm going to be running that company. And right now we're doing about $25, $30 million a year. And basically right now the only person above me is the president of the guy that owns the company, but I'm doing the day-to-day -day operations for that company. So the, that, there wasn't necessarily obstacles, there was always opportunity. So an obstacle, you got to look at that as an opportunity. Um, my brother always said to me that I was lucky. But I don't, I don't look at it as luck. I always looked at it that there was always a door to be opened and I opened the door. Sometimes you got hit in the face with it, sometimes you didn't. But the more doors you open, the more people you speak to, keep opening the doors. And that's kind of how I, I lost those obstacles. So I didn't look at it as obstacles. I looked at it as an opportunity. So that would be my two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the term roadless travel, I guess, you know, so, so show of hands, who, who uses their GPSs and their cars religiously? Like you can't live without it, right? Okay, and, and then and then who who just kind of like wings it and figures out, makes it up, right? Okay. All the guys, all the girls. Yeah, I know. So, so I rely on my GPS religiously because I'm, I, I can't find my way out of this room without it properly. Um, you know, my wife will just you know, just knows where she's going and that happens, right? But, but I think it's kind of like that to a degree, which is, um, you can be very prescriptive about the path you go down and to kind of figure out where you're going. Um, we're, we're not kind of the opposite way. So, you know, for me, my personal experience is while I can't figure out how to get out of this room with that GPS, um, there are opportunities like you just kind of have to wing it. You just have to just go down a, a road, a dirt road that may lead nowhere, may lead to the most interesting thing that you've ever done. And, stuff will happen, right? But I think the key is to get out in the road, to get out there, to not just you know, sit inside a room. You know, as Jeff said, networking yourself out there and so forth is extremely important because the stuff will happen to you. And the stuff that you, you can't predict, stuff you can't know today, but the stuff will, will absolutely happen. And whether you're the kind of person that needs to kind of really minutely plan it out, kind of know exactly where your career is going and then try to map it out, you're someone who just wings it. Um, you know, the, the key is both those, both those uh, but those philosophies will work. Um, the key is that we get out there to get out on the road and actually do something. Because when you get out on the road, stuff happens. Sometimes it's an accident, unfortunately. But uh, you know, definitely, definitely get out on the road and you know, make stuff happen. Like Chuck said, sometimes you have to jump, you know, and you know, I guess we've all done that. You know, making the leap to Chile to live there. Yeah. Sometimes you have to jump. You know, the deep end is scary, but you know, um, if you fail, you know what? That's one thing you won't fail at again. You know, that's you know, if you fail at it once. If Again, that's, I would say there's something wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, Einstein and, and Edison and the light bulb, I mean, throwing my engineering background out of it, I mean, they, they tried a thousand times before they made the light bulb and the light bulb everything. So, again, it's not being let down because they're going to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
really hard, and I have a lot of naysayers, a lot of people saying, you know, but do you want to be a doctor? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, why are you going to medical school? So it turned, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I didn't necessarily, have, people thought I was kind of crazy, um, but I also, you do things for a reason, and things don't happen for a reason, and you can always make the best of any situation. So um, I think taking risks is really important, and being not being afraid to go off, off the beaten path. Um, even if it's something that everybody else is telling you that you're not, um, you know, granted I was, and I, I, you know, I'm glad I made my decision, but um, it, definitely taking the risk and getting off the path is really important. Kind of relating to what um, Lauren just said, um, talking about the um, you know, myself as a native West Philadelphia, growing up in a single family, single headed uh, household. You know, going to Drexel, a lot of people said you're not going to succeed at that, graduating, getting your MBA degree, going on to business. So there's always obstacles or all these naysayers that are always in your, in your way. But inherently, you usually have some, some type of drive or some type of motivation that says you can go above and beyond your means. So what were some of the, what did you expect to be some of the roadblocks or causes for concern that necessarily weren't? That, you kind of either change those roadblocks and the opportunities, or they really weren't roadblocks at all. Simple word, cash. <laughs> cash, that's it, okay? It's just cash. Um, you always worry about that, right? You always worry about where the money's coming from. Should I take the secure thing that's going to give me some stability because I got Loans, I've got whatever, I've got stuff that I can have to deal with. Um, if, I, if I thought about that too much in starting the latest company that I started, having a family, having five kids, having a house, having cars, having all this stuff around you, if I worried about that, I thought that was going to be an obstacle, um, I probably would have never started it and would be sitting up here today. So. I think the moral story there is you'll, you'll figure it out, stuff will happen. Um, you'll, you'll make it happen because you want it to happen. And it won't always be easy. And there'll be struggles and trials and waking up at 3 in the morning and cold sweat and panicking, which I still occasionally do. <laughs> but um, I did this week. Um, but, uh, but, but you'll figure it out. So yeah, I think the moral story is you're going to see those obstacles, but don't always assume they're obstacles that you can't overcome. And cash is one of those really big obstacles. It's something you really believe in, um, and you can get other people to believe in it with you, including friends and family that can support you and help you get through it. Stuff will happen when it gets desperate and tough. You'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah, can I say something to that actually about friends and family supporting you? Um, when I wrote my book, uh, again, I thought I was nuts. Like, what are you doing? You know, shouldn't you be sleeping? You know, residency, and, you know, when everyone else is, you know, resting, and I was out. One of the things that was really frightening for me was getting the book out there into the world. Um, and when I said I'm going to write a book, my, my parents, one of my parents, I say, um, was like, how much is that going to cost? And how are you planning on doing that? And blah, blah, blah. And I just said, you know what, it's only one person that I don't know. Um, one person who I don't know to read my book, learn something from it, and you know, maybe be entertaining, even though it's not that thing that it's also entertaining. Um, so I said, if, if that's if what I'm going to do is going to do that for one person, then that's going to be success for me. And then it came to that one person, um, and that one person read the book, and then it became two people. And now it's, I want one person in every state in the country. And I'm at 20 states, so not there yet, but your goals should morph and change sort of as you move through your careers. Um, and having family support is so important. My father is my PR agent. He's actually the reason that I'm here, because he has my so um, my dad's my PR agent. The cover of my book was designed by my brother. Um, my book agent is in California, and you know she's almost like family now. So it's it's one of those things where once you do get the support of your friends and family, it doesn't matter how small it is. You know, in the beginning we were selling the book out of my dad's house, out of the garage, and it was really cool. And now it's become more than that. Um, but I think having the support of your family is really important. They don't support you at, for, at first in what your idea is or your decisions are. It's important to explain to them why this is important and to help you to sort of reach your goal. Because I couldn't have done it without my family. Even
even though in the beginning they thought I was totally not. We have a few questions posed by audience members in advance, and one of them is uh, very interesting, uh, especially thinking about the next generation, is how would you encourage a third grade student to pursue a career in science or engineering? So we have a few science and engineering. That's an engineer who uh, gets involved in some of this stuff, um, and with a three-year-old son, uh, probably the best way to encourage them is to Sounds weird, but we've all done it. We've all had fun with it. We all got sprayed with coke. But to a third grader, somebody that's eight years old, they have no idea what's going on. They just think it's fun. But there's a chemical reaction that happens there. So there's things like that, is showing them. And actually, um, you know, for myself, I can't wait till it's bring your dad to school day and see what the cool things you can do. So um, for Halloween, I, he wanted to be a fireman, so I made his wagon into a fire truck. So I mean, I help, and I, he helped me do it. So I think showing. Um, being part of their lives because they're so influential. I can't put two young children. Um, but they're so influential at that age, or so influenced that I think showing them and being a part of them is that. I mean, reading a book is there, but I don't think, you know, from science and engineering, obviously you have to bring, bring it down a little bit. But I mean, it's, I think hands on is the best way to work. All right. Uh, we have another, have another question posed by our audience member. In a weak economy, does one pursue or take a job that doesn't require a graduate degree or that is outside of your field. You know, people are struggling to find jobs and sometimes they'll take a job that is beneath them, I guess, if you want to say, or doesn't have the qualification, where their qualifications exceed the job description. And if, you, if they do take that job, do you feel like you're selling yourself short or doing a disservice to the company that hires you because hiring someone is not cheap? So I guess maybe they're thinking of they're taking this job for now, but they're going to move on and so that they can find another opportunity. I don't know if any of you have opinions or experiences in that type of uh, experience. Yeah, I've got a very strong opinion about that. Um, it may sound a little counterintuitive, but um, absolutely take the job. And think of it as a funding vehicle for what you really want to do, right? So when I started to build a college company coming out of the plan VA, um, I was very fortunate to be able to negotiate a severance package with company and then leave that. But I also negotiated a consulting contract with them, which essentially kept me in that company. It was very, very fortunate just for doing its timing. Uh, so I continued to work that job 40 hours a week or more, 60 hours a week in some cases, while starting this other company, this other thing. And